Input output operations are usually the slowest part of any program. Why? Because they often involve waiting on something outside the CPU. Think of writing to a desk, reading from it, waiting for a user to click, sending an HTTP request or querying a database. These tasks take time and that's what makes them bottlenecks in your code. So, why is reading data from a desk considered slow? It all comes down to hardware. Accessing RAM takes just nanoseconds. But when you're dealing with disk or network operations, you're looking at milliseconds. And that's a huge difference. Same story with bandwidth. RAM can transfer data at gigabytes per second. Disk and networks, they usually cap out at megabytes per second. And only in the best case scenarios do they touch gigabytes. And then, there is the human factor. Sometimes your app is just sitting there waiting for a person to press a key or click a button. That kind of IO isn't just slow, it's unpredictable. So it's not just about machines, people slow things down too. IO operations can seriously slow things down. When a thread hits an IO task, like an API call, database query or disk write, it gets blocked. That means the CPU just sits idle, waiting. In this example, you can see how different requests are processed. The green boxes like passing JSON or XML keep the CPU busy. But the red ones, API request, DB query or disk write block the thread. And while that thread waits, nothing else can move forward. So you might think, why not just create more threads? Give each request its own thread and let the server handle them all at once. Sounds smart, right? Well, it does work to a point. But here is the catch. Every thread needs memory and CPU resources. And when the thread hits an IO operation, like reading from disk or waiting on a database, it just sits there doing nothing. Zero CPU usage, just waiting. Now imagine hundreds of threads doing that. You're wasting a lot of resources. And it gets worse. Managing all those threads isn't easy. You can run into race conditions, deadlocks, or live locks. Plus, the operating system has to keep switching between them, which adds even more overhead. So yeah, more threads sounds good on paper, but in practice, it can slow you down even more. And thankfully, we have come up with smarter ways to handle these IO heavy operations more efficiently. And one of those concepts is called even demultiplexer. At the core of its technique is called multiplexing. Basically combining multiple signals to share limited resource like CPU or RAM. For example, in telecom, multiple phone calls can travel over a single wire. To simplify, think of those old school phone switchboards. The board watches for incoming calls. Each call lights up a bulb. The operator sees it, picks up and routes the call. That's exactly how an even demultiplexer behaves. Waiting for signals, notifying the system and letting the actual work happen only when needed. The same idea applies to computers too. But instead of phones, the event sources are things like file descriptors, network sockets, timers, or input devices. These sources can trigger events, like there is data to read, ready to write, or new connection request. And the cool part, operating systems already have built-in support for this. For example, Linux uses ePoll, Mac OS uses KQ, and Windows uses IOCP. All of them follow the event demultiplexer model to efficiently handle tons of events without wasting CPU cycles. Node.js handles all this under the hood using a powerful library called libuv, which brings the event demultiplexer concept to life, managing IO, timers, and background tasks efficiently. I have broken this down in detail in my other videos especially the ones on the Node.js event loop, worker threads, and how libuv makes Node non-blocking and super fast. So if you're curious about how it all fits together, definitely check those out next.